Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Have you ever had a crisis of faith? A, a moment where your experience just isn't matching up with, with what you believe? A moment that what you had held to or what you had banked on or maybe even something you had defended to others didn't seem to be holding up. Maybe you believed if you went to church and if you treated people well, life would go smoothly, but your life has been one of constant turbulence. Maybe you thought that if you were faithful to give to charities and save consistently throughout your life, your retirement account would allow complete freedom in your golden years, but now you're finding out that your bank balance isn't keeping up with inflation. Maybe you thought that people who love God and treated others well would be rewarded with a promotion and get ahead in their finances or, or at least have good health, but the longer you go through life, the more it may seem that the hardship rate for believers is almost exactly the same as the hardship rate for people who don't believe at all. In fact, sometimes it could seem like believers have it harder than people who don't believe, and people who don't believe seem to get ahead in this life. And if you notice those things, it can get really discouraging. And if you think enough about it, you may begin to wonder, is it even worth it? Why do, I, why do I come to church? Why do I sing his praise? Why do I give offerings to him? Why do I pray? This is what's going on in Psalm 73. The author is Asaph, a Levite who is serving as worship leader under King David. I guess he's the Jewish version of Nuno. And deep down in his heart, he knows that God is good uh, and he's been taught since he was a child that God is good to his people. And that's why he starts Psalm 73 with kind of a faith proclamation that God is really good to Israel, especially to those who are pure in heart. He believed what all psalm writers believe, that, that God is a good God. And he, he believed it because he was taught that there were two paths. If you follow God, you'll be like a tree that's healthy, planted by water. You'll give forth fruit and your leaf won't wither and life will be good. But if you don't follow God, then you're like the chaff and you just kind of blow away and life is rough and you lead to, it leads you to ruin. That's what all the psalm writers believed. But Asaph is feeling this tension because what he believes is not squaring with what he sees. His understanding of how God operated the world isn't co coinciding with this experience. And this is leading to a crisis of faith. He says, but as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps, they, they nearly went astray. Uh, verse 3, he says, for I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The the wicked people were making more money and they were gaining more notoriety and they were advancing in almost every area. They seemed to have it made and, and he even says they even have an easy time until they die throughout their life. It just seems to go easier for them. Your Bible might say something like this, that even in death they don't have the same pains. It's almost like uh, you know, believers struggle and, and face hard illnesses and, and they just go to sleep and die. And he's struggling, really struggling. Uh, verse 4 continues. It says, their bodies are well fed. They don't wonder where their next meal is coming from. Abundance is all around them. And, and verse 5, it says, they're, they're not in trouble like others. They're not afflicted like most people. When he looked at them, he thought, man, they seem to be winning. 
They're beautiful, and they have the front row seats to all the games, and they fly first class everywhere, and they don't seem to be burdened like everybody else. They have house cleaners and personal assistants and wear designer clothes, and their kids get scholarships to go to school, and they get the best jobs, and this is how he's feeling. He's really struggling, and they don't even recognize that God is the giver of all good gifts. I appreciate Daniel's prayer uh, to remind us that we have so many good things that God has given us, and they don't even acknowledge it. Instead, pride is their necklace. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Uh, and not only are they proud, their pride makes them hateful toward others. Violence covers them. They oppress people just because they can get away with it, and they think they deserve their life. Their eyes, he says, bulge from fatness. They're, they're stuffed with so much abundance that their eyes are popping out of their head. And their imaginations in their hearts run wild. They have no break when it comes to indulgence. They invent new ways to chase pleasure. Verse 8 tells us that they mock and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They're hubris and their luxury blinds them to who the Lord is and to how he rules the world. They think they're free of divine restraint. Verse 9, it says, they set their mouth against heaven. They're brazen in, in their accusations against God. They even talk to God's people in verse 11 and say, God doesn't know what's going on. How does God know everything? Look at life. God can't be in control of this. And when Asaph thinks of them in ex exasperation, he says, look at them, God. The wicked, look at them, they're wicked. They're always at ease, and they increase in their wealth. Now, obviously, there's some hyperbole here because we know that Jesus taught us the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We know that life happens for everybody, but this is how he's feeling. He, 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 he's like... Wait a minute, the, 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 the wicked, they shouldn't even have one good day. And they seem to be getting ahead in life. They don't go to the temple, they don't serve God, they don't give offerings, they don't even believe in God. And yet winds are stacking up for them. And their success and their taunts aren't the only problem. They're leading God's people away. Notice what he said in verse 10. Therefore, his people turn to them, and they drink in their overflowing words. This can be the most disheartening thing. People who once seemed to love God are now walking away. That's incredibly disheartening. And when believers see these things, they can start to wonder, why am I hanging in there? Why am I still here? Notice what he says in verse 13, did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? Have I, have I been doing all of this for nothing? In verse 14, he says, for I'm afflicted all day long. I'm punished every morning. They've got it easy. I've got it hard. I tithed, they didn't, and yet I've got nothing. I'm under constant financial strain. I, I was never promiscuous or unfaithful. They run around on each other. And yet my marriage is the one on the rocks. I took my kids to church and they didn't. And yet my kids are the ones that are rebelling. You know, doubts can creep in when it goes this way. You start to think, did I believe the right things? Am I living on the right path? People will sometimes come to me with their doubts. And often when they're telling me about their doubts, they'll look at me and say, Pastor, do you ever doubt? And I will look at them and say, of course not. Only sinners doubt. You know, no, I don't say that. Everybody doubts. We all do. Doubt's a part of the thinking life. If you've never doubted, the chances are your faith has never left this building. Doubt is the inevitable reality that happens whenever life's experience intersects with faith's platitudes. And this is hard. A few years ago in Texas, a young pastor in a brand new church plant 
that about a two-year-old church plant, one that was a lot like ours that are meeting today at Jessman Station. But they had grown like crazy. They were in a metropolitan area, and they were up to almost 500 people. And he was baptizing. And he wasn't satisfied with the quality of the mic. And so he reached up and grabbed the mic, and there was a short in it. And he was electrocuted in front of the congregation, getting ready to baptize a young lady. That's hard. Why does God let something like that happen? Or a young family in our community who is raising their kids well, sending them to Christian school, mother of two, dies suddenly a couple of years ago. Or even a young family in our church who experiences the loss of a child. And it seems like those who don't even want children or care about children are, 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 are able to have kids and they go through this and there's these questions. God, why, 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 does, why does it go down like this? But it's even harder for Asaph because his job is to lead the praise of God's people. He's supposed to stand up on Sunday morning and he's supposed to tell people, God is good. And he said, if I had said what I'm thinking out loud, I would have betrayed your people. He didn't want people to stumble, and he didn't want to hurt the community, so he kept silence, silent, but the silence was doing something internally to him because he said, when I would think about it, I would just seem hopeless. It was like nothing was working, and this is where a lot of people find themselves. Maybe some of you even today have found yourself there. Oh, you don't talk about it a lot because you don't want people to stumble because of you and you think maybe you're the only one who thinks like this and you're wondering, hey, this doesn't seem to make sense. The problem is a lot of people have those thoughts and they just stop there. They check out. They don't try to understand. And, and, and this doubt leads to denial and oh you might still come and sit in the seats but your hearts aren't there I encourage you today to not stop reading Psalm 73 at verse 16 you got to keep going because the psalmist gives us a path forward he shows us a way to work through our doubts and a way to deal with the hard realities of life in verse 17 he says this is what was going on in me. I was hopeless until I entered the sanctuary of God. Maybe God just showed up one week at, at temple when they were singing praises congregationally, when they were singing these psalms. Maybe God just showed up in a powerful way and he, he, he brought resolution to Asaph's heart. Or maybe he's talking about those inner sanctuaries, those private moments where in personal prayer, God just showed up and spoke to Asaph's life. Or maybe he was preparing. You know, I, I watch Nuno sometimes go through here and prepare on Thursdays as he's getting ready for a practice. And, and I'll hear him singing sometimes in here. And maybe it was just one of those moments where he was preparing uh, to lead God's people. But whatever happened, however it happened, God did a couple of things in Asaph's life. When he leaned into God, God gave him perspective. God helped him have perspective first about the wicked. He says, and then I understood their destiny. I understood that, that God had put them in slippery places and he made them to fall into ruin. While watching them have their good time, the psalmist forgot that they were heading toward a terrible end. The wicked and unbelievers may seem like they're winning, but they will come to an end, and it will come quickly. How suddenly they become a desolation. A desolation. They come to an end and swept away by terrors. God's destruction of the wicked will be like waking up from a dream. You know, a dream can seem so long and so real, but only seconds after waking up, you realize it was nothing but a mirage. It was just your imagination while you were sleeping. The psalmist goes on to say, 
like one waking from a dream, they're going to come to a harsh reality. Lord, when you arise and you bring your judgment, you will despise their image. When they wake up, they'll realize you do not sleep on the job, God. And when God wakes them up from their dream, he will despise their image. Boy, that's so different than what we do with their image. We have a tendency to envy the successful and to desire their life. If I could go on that vacation, if I could drive that car, if I could have their income or their fame or their life, if I could be Tiger Woods, if I could be Taylor Swift or whoever you put in the blank, I'd have it made. But the reality is, The rich without God are on their way to being eternally poor. And celebrities without God are on their way to being eternally ignored. Verse 21, he says, when I became embittered and when my innermost being was wounded, he says, I was being stupid. I didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal. I was just dumb as a rock. Uh, When he looked around, he he was frustrated, but in light of eternity, he knows his frustration was just dumb. Everything on this earth is here today and gone tomorrow, but this life is not all there is. There is an eternity, and God will sort things out. And not only does he gain this perspective that this life is not all there is, he also remembers something, that God is better than anything else. He remembers the, this is not a real word, but the betterness of God. In spite of his frustration and complaints, God reminds him that they're always together. The psalmist says, I'm always with you, Lord. I know you're always here. You're faithful. And he needed to learn that. And we needed to learn that. And we need to learn that God is always with us. And our circumstances do not dictate whether God is with us or not. Some pulpits will preach to you that your life and how it goes is a determiner of God's favor on your life. That's garbage. God is not more present in your life because it's blue skies and smooth sailing than he is when it is a difficult, hard, stormy day. You see, your your best life now, that's not a sign of God's presence. And your hardest moment is not proof of God's absence. God is with you. He does not abandon his people. And even when you're weak, like Asaph, he holds you with his right hand. He doesn't abandon his people. Even when you're questioning his goodness, God will not let go of you. You see, our message that we preach here is not that God holds us because we're good. God doesn't take you to heaven because you're a moral person and treat people right. We don't preach here that God holds on to you because you're grateful. You should be grateful, but that's not why God loves you. You, You're all going to have plenty of moments of ingratitude in your life. God doesn't even love you because you're religious. If you've never been baptized, I'm going to beg you to get baptized to follow the Lord Jesus. If you've never accepted Jesus, I I would plead with you, please give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But I want to tell you, if you're, even if you're baptized or show up to church or give your tithe and do religious things, that is not why God holds on to you. He holds on to you because you're his child. You're a believer. You believe that God is so good that in spite of your sin, he sent his only son Jesus to die for you. Uh, we believe that, that Jesus paid for our rebellion and he died in our place. And we believe that whoever believes in him has the right to be children of God. We preach every week that not everyone on this planet is a child of God. We preach that people are children of God. Everybody's created by God. Everybody's created with the special image of God. Everyone is important to God. But you only become a child of God when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you trust in his name instead of your own. And if you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I beg you today. And if you come Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and listen, but you know you've not transferred your trust from yourself to Christ, I beg you today, give your heart and life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He will save you, and he will hold on to you, and he will never leave you, ever. Stuff is stuff. 
And sometimes you have a lot, and sometimes you have nothing. When you have Jesus, you have everything. So I encourage you to give your life to him. And if you've never done that, then here's three things you could do today. And I'm going to ask you to do one of those three. One, take a next step card and on the back say, I'm placing my trust in Christ. I'm going to give my life to Christ today. You can put that card uh, in the uh, offering boxes, which are right outside the door. Or you could fill out the QR code. The exact same information is there and say, I want to put my faith in Christ today. I want to trust Christ today. Put your name on the front, a way to contact you, and either by this afternoon or tomorrow morning, a pastor will re reach out to you and we'll talk to you about what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ and to follow him as Lord in your life. I'd love for you to do that. But I'll tell you what, what I would do is today before I left this building, I'd come down after the service is over. There are pastors who wait here every week just to talk to people who would like to give their life to Jesus. We'd love for you to come and talk to you today about what it means to give your life to Christ. Now, if God has saved you, you don't need to get re-saved. I, I want to make sure that you get this. You don't need to get re-saved. Here, we don't re-baptize people a lot. And the reason we don't is I don't want you to think that you somehow have the, 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 the deficiency or the expertise to get you into heaven. Your trust needs to move from you and your ability and your religiosity onto Jesus and what he has done. I know I'm going to heaven not because I prayed the prayer right or I walked the aisle at, the cert at a certain time or I, I was repentant enough or I was good enough or I understood enough and I've just transferred my trust from me onto Jesus. And the reason I know I'm going to go to heaven is I have put all my life in on him. And Jesus, I trust you. I need you. And that it's what gives me security. And so if you're here and you're saved, you don't need to get resaved. If you know that you've had a moment where Jesus Christ has come into your life, you maybe have lived like a pagan since then, but if you know that, what you need to do is you need to wake up and you need to see how good God is compared to this junk that people are chasing in this world. God shows up every time. When you pray, he's there. When, when you're hurting, he walks beside you. When you need him, he is attentive to you. You desperately need to start living in this faith that you have. A lot of us are trapped in verse 1 through 16. Man, I don't have this. I don't have that. We need to move. And that movement happens when we somehow get to a place where God wakes us up. And we realize, oh, I've got so much. Thank you, God. When we're saved, the Lord leads us. He guides us with his counsel. We know what is right and wrong because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We understand that there's more than this life and that there is an eternity. We realize that giving away is better than hoarding. We know that love is better than hate. We believe that forgiveness is good for the offender and for the offended. We know that pride is harmful. You know why we know these things? God has taught them to us. The Holy Spirit has convinced our hearts. And we know there's eternal reward. Afterward, he'll take us to glory. Yes, we suffer in the present. Yes, we don't, uh, people who don't love God make fun of us. Yes, life may be one series of hardships for believers. And yes, those who don't follow God may have it easier. But we still get heaven. I mean, <laughs> we still win. The scales will be tipped in the favor of God's people. And there is a day coming when it will be obvious that following God is worth it. And boy, I long for that day sometimes, don't you? I look forward to the reunion with loved ones in heaven. I, I, I really don't understand the rewards of heaven. I know about the crowns and different things, but I don't understand how it works. But it sounds cool, and I'm looking forward to it. And on top of that, in heaven you get all the no mores, right? No more dying. No more crying, no more pain, no more politics, no more telemarketers, no more Nicholasville Road at 5 o'clock. Amen. I mean, heaven is going to be great. But you know what makes heaven really great? It's God. The psalmist gets it. He says, who do I in heaven but you? Heaven is heaven because God is there. That's what makes it so awesome. And that's what happens to the psalmist. He starts thinking about heaven and it dawns on him. Man, I've got you in heaven. 
And I've got you now. What could be better than having God in your lives? He says, I desire nothing on earth like you. I desire nothing on earth but you. This is the source and the secret of Christian joy. We who have found God have found out that he's better than anything else on this earth. His name lifts our soul. Man, I can be lower than a snake's belly and come in and hear the name of Jesus sung and find a lightness comes over me. I, I, I can have the anxieties of the world crushing in on me and think about Jesus and I get peace. I can... stand at a casket and have comfort because his promise gives hope and what the psalmist realizes is when we take our eyes off the world and off of what we don't have or what we're going through and we put our eyes on Christ we won't feel slighted imagine for me or imagine with me for a minute imagine you have a an uncle that you didn't know about that was loaded. And he loved you for some reason. And he decided to leave you millions upon millions. The bank calls you and you're like, oh yeah, right. No, 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 we're serious. He's left you this money. You just need to come and do some paperwork. You come and do the paperwork and then they tell you, you're going to be able to pick up your money in two weeks. Your mind's thinking about this money. You're wondering, can this possibly be real? You get in your I think I can make it car and you drive down to the bank on the day that you're supposed to pick up your money. You're about a half a mile from the bank and your beater dies on the side of the road and people are flying by you and it looks like they're having the time of their life. I mean, Beamers and Corvettes are flying by you. Teslas are trying to make it and they're going by you just... <laughs> You one right after another. You know what doesn't happen? You don't go, oh man. How can I deal with this? You know? No, you're you're skipping to the bank. You're whistling because you're not gonna buy a car, you're gonna buy a car a lot. You know, you're not worried about it because of what you have. Guys, what we have inherited in Christ is better. It's just better. And yes, for the moment, we have pain and hardships and burdens. But there is coming a day where the one who gives us strength now will be our son in that day. Where the one who holds us now will be the one who captivates us in that day. Asaph had taken his eyes off the prize, and he knows it. He says in verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Then he says in verse 27, those far from you will certainly perish. I've had my eyes on the wrong stuff. You, you destroy the unfaithful, you'll take care of that God. But as for me, God's presence is my good. And I've made the Lord God my refuge so that I can tell others, tell all, about what God does, what you do, God. Let me ask you a question. Are you at a place that you can say that the Lord is enough for you? Where you see others with wealth and health and youth, are you at a place where if you have God, that's enough? Would you open yourself up to the possibility that a relationship with God is better than anything else in this life. The psalmist did. Truly God is good. And it doesn't matter what happens. Because truly God is good. Here's what I want you to take away today. The first thing I want you to take away. Is that injustice and limited human perspective. Can and does create doubt in us. It, it, it does. We just have to acknowledge that. But I also want you to understand 
that God's future judgment assures justice for all. God has placed eternity in our hearts. We know that there is a day coming. There is a reckoning. There is a payday someday. We know that for us who believe and for those who don't. That assures justice. The third thing I want you to take away is doubts are not resolved by pushing away from God in some self-righteous deconstruction. Oh, look what I've done. I'm so smart. I ask hard questions. And stiff-arm God like he has no answer. No, doubts are resolved by leaning into God, by continuing to show up, by continuing to get on your knees, by continuing to open the word. That's how doubt is, is handled. And God will, in his time, in a way that's good for you. And then I want you to take away that if you will lean into Jesus, I do believe you will really find out that there is nothing better than him. I pray that you will do that. Let's, let's pray together. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach your word today. I thank you for how good you are. And God, I'd be the first to admit, and you know it's true, that I, uh, I sometimes can get my eyes on the wrong things. And I get frustrated at times, and I've even doubted at times. But God, I thank you for your goodness and how good you truly are. And I thank you, Lord, for those moments where when my feet almost slip, you hold me tight. And when my heart almost fails, you give me confidence. God, I pray for your people, Lord, that we would believe that you are better. And God, I do pray for anybody here today who's never put their faith in you. Oh, they may have played religious games, God, but if they've never put their faith in you, please convict them, Lord. Help them to know that you are real and that you are good. God, I pray today as we continue to go forward that you would honor yourself and your son Jesus as we remember him today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Today we have the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper together. If you didn't receive a cup on your way in, uh, you're welcome to get up over the next couple of minutes and get one of those. Um, we believe that the Lord's Supper or communion, whichever you want to call it, is a time where believers proclaim uh, that, that Jesus is the only way that we're right with God. And we proclaim that his death is the reason that we're right with God, that he paid the price for our wrong because we talk about the wicked in the Psalms. The Bible says we are the wicked in the Psalms. And we're only righteous because of what Christ has done. And so we proclaim when we take the Lord's Supper that this is what makes us right. Now, we believe that communion should only be taken by believers. I believe by believers who are baptized. Because that's a first step of obedience. Because you're identifying and saying, I'm going to step into Jesus, symbolically into the water, and let him cover me. Uh, if you've been baptized and you're a believer, we would encourage you to participate with us today. Uh, we take communion, uh, and almost every time we take time to reflect. As individuals, we just quietly reflect on our life. <laughs> Nobody deserves what we have in Christ. So it's not like you're worthy to take communion. What you're really doing is saying, Lord, I, I confess that I need you. You know my sin. You know my heart. You know my wrong. Lord, I, I repent of that. I, I, I know you've covered me in Jesus, and I'm so sorry that sometimes I stray. Uh, so we're going to take just a moment or two just to, just to talk to the Lord, to prepare our hearts, to, to, to acknowledge together that Jesus has made us clean. So let's take about 45 seconds to a minute and just pray right where you are.
this time, if you would take the bread that's in one side of the cup, and when I take it, we'll take it together. But when we take the bread, we remember that our sin and our rebellion cost the Lord his life on the cross. He endured on our behalf so that we could be forgiven. He suffered so that we could be set free. So today we remember him as we take the bread together. As we take the cup, we proclaim the saving power of the blood of Jesus. His blood cleanses us of all of our sin. Let's remember him as we take it together. Church, would you please stand?